All of you can hear me, right? Okay. So, good morning. Uh, so today we'll be talking about two tasks, basically the face classification and face verification problem. Uh, these are the two tasks that you'll be implementing for your homework two part two assignment. And uh, <coughs> please make sure that you start off early. This is a comp much comp more complicated task than you think it is. So, yeah. So what we'll be looking at today is basically the problem statement, what is verification and what is classification, what is an open set versus closed set, and how you can uh, use the concept of transfer learning for the uh, task of uh, face verification. We'll also be looking at some of the statistics on the data. And since many of you requested for usage of data set and data loader, we'll also be going through the data set and data loader classes for this particular task in the, in the notebook, along with uh, an example of residual block architecture and a few other losses. We'll also be looking at the model architecture, some of them that you can experiment with and something that you can start off with. And lastly, here I'll be discussing about the objective functions and how you can like optimize your network for a better performance. So coming to the problem statement, there are two tasks that you have. Uh, one is the classification task, which is basically uh, n-way identification of the given face ID. The other one is the verification task. And what we'll be doing here is to use transfer learning so that you can design a system for face verification. So why transfer learning? Because this particular task is going to implement uh, NVA classification of faces first, and then you will be using this particular model and transfer this model weights into another model, which will, you will be fine tuning for face verification. So, what we really want to do is to train a convolutional neural net to extract and learn these features that can be useful for, for face verification, which is very different from the task of face classification. So here's a rough outline of the general approach that we'll be using for face verification. So you'll have, let's assume that you have a, a pre-trained convolutional neural net architecture, uh, which is going to uh, give you a feature embedding at the final, as the final output. So you pass in the image to the CNN, and it's going to give you a unique face embedding for it. And similarly, you pass in another input, and you have, now you have two embeddings. Now, what we'll be basically doing is to uh, calculate the distance between these two embeddings that the neural network architecture returns. And this could be any distance metric, like the Euclidean distance or something that, of that manner. And for a ve well-trained uh, feature embedding, the metric of similarity between these two images should be good enough. So the other thing in this assignment uh, that we uh, haven't come across earlier is the ta uh, open versus closed set problems. So problems that we have seen earlier in the course are all closed set problems, where you have, be, uh, you have been given a training set, uh, and the data is very, uh, <clears throat> and even though the data is different in the training set than, uh, than from the test set, we believe that it is distributed in the same way as the test data. So what, I'm, uh, what I mean is that the, we can assume that the classes represented in the test set are there in the train and the evaluation data as well. So however, in the problem that we have given you for homework two, part two, this is not the case. We, the faces that you will be provided as test cases for the verification task are likely to be disjoint from the training data set. So, you might come across some face IDs which did not occur during your training phase, and you'll have to find the similarity between this, but these faces uh, as you come across them in the trials. So, why, uh, so one of the main uh, goals is to learn those features in your network such that they are general enough, and you don't like fit them to the data that you look, uh, that you find in your training set. So this is a very simple explanation of the problem that we have. 
So the training set remains the same for both uh, the classification and the verification task. The first column on the left is the classification task, uh, and the column on the right is the verification task. The problem of identification or classification is that given a face, you want your model to classify who it is. So this is a closed set task. Uh, say you have been given a thousand known face IDs, and now given an, a new test face, you know that one of these, uh, this particular image exists in one of those thousand face IDs. While in the verification model, uh, given two face I two face images, you want to identify whether they are the same. One way to approach the classification task is that you can have a gallery of faces, and instead of actually predicting an n-way classification model, you can what you can do is go across the similarity between each of between the test face and each of the faces in a gallery of faces. So that is basically trying to find out the similarity between the test face and all the existing face IDs and finding out which is the closest face ID that resembles the test face. So that is not something that we'll be doing for this particular homework. You'll just be implementing an NVA classifier for the classification task. Uh, but in the case of face recognition, so you have a training set. Uh, and there are two ways that you can look at the problem for face verification. One is that it's, it's a closed set problem, and the other one is that it's an open set problem. So if it's an open set problem, how you would go about it is basically that you know that all the test images are going to be from the same data set. So you can, in, uh, what you can do is run your test images through the classifier, uh, predict the class that that particular image belongs to, and once you've predicted the class of both the images, uh, both the input images, you can just do a bi binary, you can just check if these two class IDs that have been predicted are equal. And that should uh, give you the idea of whether they are the same face or not. But in the open set problem, since you're sure that some of the images never existed in the training data set, you should create your feature embedding uh, for each of the images and then compare these embeddings using some distance metric or similarity metric. And this is how, and you'll have a, a score from anything between zero to one that's basically a raw score, uh, not necessarily a binary value for telling you how close these two images are. So coming to the classification versus verification, as I mentioned, classification is a simple NVA uh, identification task. You have to predict from a closed set of labels. Verification is, so as I said, you can do a one-to-n matching and then predict the closest among the n given samples. The other one is the one-to-one -one matching task where you'll just verify whether the two given, uh, the embeddings of two given, given faces are the same, uh, how similar these two embeddings are, are. And this is the task that you'll be performing for the homework, the one-to-one -one matching task. So <clears throat> how do we apply transfer learning for the verification task? So transfer learning is a very uh, simple machine learning method where you develop a model for a primary task and the model that you develop for the primary task is later used as the starting point for tuning a similar, tuning a similar second task. So the two uh, approaches to transfer learning are the develop model approach and the pre-trained model approach. Uh, in the develop model approach, you select a source or a primary task and develop the model from scratch. So you write your own CNN model or you train the model from the, from the uh, time you initialize the weights to on a given data set. And then you use this trained model for the second task where you copy the weights of the layers, uh, intermediate layers, and then you can choose to add new layers at the end and fine tune it for the second task. Whereas in the pre-trained model, you use the uh, pre-trained models such as the ResNets or the VGG nets from the frameworks that you have. And basically you just copy those weights. Again, here you can choose to 
or omit copying weights of the final layers and fine tune those for your particular task at hand. Uh, so for, uh, for the homework, you will not be using the pre-trained model approach. Uh, the data that we've given you will not, does not resemble any of the existing data, ImageNet data sets. So you should follow the developed model approach. That is to design your own classifier for the classification task and then use transfer learning. That is basically use the same model for your verification task. And we'll be looking at uh, some examples of how to do this. So <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned before, you'll first be training the model for the classification task, fine tune it for the verification, and you e extract the intermediate representations of these face images. So what you should be doing is when you're developing your model for the classification task, make sure that you have access to the intermediate embeddings, which is what you will be using to find the similarity between two different given face images. And yeah, so the network, and make sure that your network is not fitting into the given training data set classes. You should make sure that it's more generalized and it learns more discriminative features, as this is not just classification that you are looking at, but the verification. So how do we go about face verification? So in this case, you have an in, in input image. Uh, you're going to look, uh, pass that through your convolutional neural network architecture, which the output of which is going to go through an embedding layer. And then the output of the embedding layer is going to be a two-dimensional embedding that you pass through a classification layer. So the classification layer, you pass this through the softmax, basically the cross entropy objective or the criterion, and which is going to result in n, the n class probabilities, uh, which you can then use for the loss. Uh, but now coming to verification, you'll be just using the embedding layer. Uh, you, you'll instead of passing the embedding to the classification layer, you'll just use that embedding as the input to another loss or a distance metric. So you'll, you'll get the embeddings for two images and then calculate the distance between these two embeddings that your embedding layer returns. Now, the data that we have given you mainly consists of five folders. The training folder is the same across <coughs> the classification and verification task. There are two subfolders in the training uh, folder or the train underscore data folder, which basically comprises of the medium and large for, uh, subfolders. The medium folder has 2,300 face IDs. So these face IDs are again represented as folders. And within these subfolders, you have the images. And similarly, in the large one, you have around 2,000 face IDs. And yeah, and then again, within these face IDs, you have the images for the large data set. Uh, <clears throat> for validation task and the testing task, the distribution is very similar. The validation, again, has the same face IDs in, in both the medium and large, but the number of images are much lesser. Whereas in the testing for the classification task for Kaggle, we'll only be uh, testing you on the uh, face IDs that have been given to you in the medium data uh, medium for our uh, data set folder of training and validation so mm, that's a close task problem as for the verification task as I said the training data is the same but then for validation and test you have a validation underscore verification folder under which you have uh, again, face IDs as subfolders in which the images are located. And <clears throat> along with this data, you're also given a trial file called validation trials verification.txt. So what the trial file basically has is a pair of face IDs along with a true label, whether a zero or one. So what this true label uh, specifies is that if it's a zero, the pair of face IDs that have been given to you are not the same person. And if it's a one, it's from the same person. So you can use this to validate your uh, verification model 
So how to get the AUC score? So the AUC score is how you'll be uh, basically uh, ranked on the leaderboard. So to get the AUC score for the validation task, we have given you a score.py file in the GitHub repo. You can look at the write-up for the link. Uh, so you can pass this particular validation trials verification.txt, and along with this, you'll be also passing the similarity score between the pair of each image that are available in the validation trials. And the score.py will return you the AUC score for the validation, uh, validation data set. Whereas for the testing, if you want to look at your AUC score, you should submit it to Kaggle. The AUC score that you will be seeing is most likely the 30% data. You will be able to see the whole thing only after the competition ends. Right, so as I mentioned earlier, the trial files contain a pair of file names, file name one and file name two. They're the relative file paths within the validation verification or the test verification folders and the label. So the label is available to you only for the validation verification trials, not for the test. Uh, so make sure that you're, when you're submitting to Kaggle, uh, you should submit this, it as a CSV with only two columns. Uh, that is basically you'll space separate the two file names, but you'll comma separate the similarity score or the uh, final label that you're assigning and not the, you won't comma separate all the three names. So a sample submission has been put on Kaggle, so you can have a look at it before you make your submissions and don't waste the number of submissions. You have limited submissions per day, I guess. Right, so <clears throat> in the classification task, mm, we have to train a convolutional neural network. The basic architecture that you could start off with is by developing the network using the conv2d layers available in PyTorch framework or any other framework that you're using. So <clears throat> remember that the input channel of your first layer will be three because the image is of three channels, R, G, and B. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that when you're pulling at the very end to create the embedding features, you would want to either use the average or max pulling uh, layers. So when you're doing so, make sure that you average across the height, height and the width and not across the batch size or the channels. Uh, yeah, that's one thing. And another thing that you should keep in mind while designing your own network is that uh, uh, when you're designing it from scratch, you can use the tapering technique. So what tapering is basically is that uh, when you start off in your network, when you start off creating your network, you can have larger filter sizes and uh, larger strides at the beginning of the network. And as you go deeper, you can reduce this filter size and strides. Uh, but make sure that you add necess uh, the necessary padding so that you don't come across any errors. So next, we'll be going through some of the popular convolutional network architectures available, which might be useful for the task that we've given you. Uh, these are some things that you might want to try for the given task uh, to get a decent enough accuracy. So one of the first architectures that came up was the AlexNet. So this was the first thing that released uh, in the deeper convolutional neural network architecture. It came up in 2012. What was the reason why it became famous was they were the, one of the first ones to use ReLU and dropouts instead of the TANH nonlinear activations, uh, which is why they became so popular. Uh, and this is when the CNNs actually started getting deeper. The next network is the VGG net, uh, which is deeper than the Alex net, and it has a bunch of fully connected layers at the very end. Uh, which is something that the VG did differently. Basically, you can see that the networks are getting deeper so they can reduce the error rate. But what actually happens is as, when, as and when they get deeper, the error rate starts decreasing until a certain point and then it starts stagnating. And if you increase layers further or if you train on these deeper networks further, you start seeing that there is an increase in this error rate after a certain point. So we don't want to just keep on increasing the number of layers in the architecture. We don't want to make it 
uh, deeper. So that's why ResNets came into picture. Mm. So what ResNet is, is basically it's a residual block architecture which has skipped connections. So what I mean by skipped connection is that uh, the input from an earlier layer is uh, fast forwarded to a layer down the network. Uh, basically, when you're fast forwarding this particular input, uh, you use an identity, identity function to concatenate these two, the input and the output of the uh, layers, out, output of the stack neural layers. So the common uh, identity function that's used is the additive identity. You just add the output of the stack neural network layers to the input that you saw at the very beginning. And the ResNets, what they do is they have blocks of these uh, skipped connections, one after the other. And you can refer to the papers for a better understanding of why and how they work and what the architecture is. ResNets have multiple different raw uh, architectures, like the ResNet 18 and so uh, 512 and so on. So uh, you can see how the deeper networks actually perform and why they perform better than the smaller networks. The next network that we are going to be discussing about is DenseNet. Uh, so DenseNet is an extension of the ResNet uh, where instead of using the identity function, they concatenate the inputs at every uh, from the previous layers within the same block. And this network encourages the feature reuse concept, which strengthens the propagation of the important features in the image. And uh, generally, dense nets are more narrower than the resnets. Uh, again, you can look at the paper to have a better understanding. Finally, so for the tasks that we have given you, face classification and verification, Mobile net and shuffle net are some architecture that we believe might help you in outperforming uh, in the task. So you surely want to have a look at these two papers. Uh, the, we're not, we aren't going, uh, this is not the only architecture that are the best, but these are something that we've tried and tested. Uh, yeah. Next, Hira will be discussing about the objectives, and then we'll be looking into the notebook. So I'm just going to hand the mic. <clears throat> this is the classroom mic. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, no, you're fine. I'm just okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just moving this down. Let's see if it will. All right. <laughs> um, so, just to recap over what a survey uh, just went through, you are basically training um, a model for face classification, which we'll be doing an N way classification. And you can use the same model for your face verification task. This will work in a way that you have your um, CNN, you have an input image which is passing through the CNN, and you have an embedding layer which extracts a vector for each uh, image input, and you're then, then doing an N-way classification. You can remove the classifier part of the network and only do the feature extraction for your uh, verification task. The whole network up from the image up till the embedding is called a feature extractor, which is basically returning you an embedding. Um, this slide shows that DNN can actually learn meaningful, meaningful features. The task here is try to identify the object in, uh, in a given image. And if you see it, one of the examples here, um, the true answer is leopard. Which, is, which the network did predict correctly. But all of the other classes, uh, like uh, jaguar, cheetah, snow leopard, Egyptian cat, are the second, third, fourth, fifth prediction for the same, uh, for the same image. 
and as you can see that the network did try to uh, the network did learn that these classes are like they belong to the same animal uh, objects in the image and it did predict the correct one but they, it has also uh, ranked um, um, all of the other similar um, classes in the same way so this just shows that dnns are able to learn meaningful features um, so for your face classification task, a very simple metric is uh, accuracy, which is very fine. But an evaluation metric for your face verification task is can be an AUC, which is area under the ROC curve. And ROC basically plots your false positive rate against true positive rate. Um, and false pos positive rate is basically when you falsely accept the null hypothesis, and in this case, you are saying that given two input images, you are incorrectly saying that they are from the same person, while in reality they are not. And the true positive rate is you are correctly accepting the two input images from the same person, while in reality they are from the same person. And so when you plot this, uh, plot these two rates uh, over different thresholds, uh, you get this kind of a curve. The more the area under the curve, the better your model is, is distinguishing between these two cases. And to just give you an idea about what kind of values are AUC values are good and what they mean, zero means that an AUC of zero means that the model is ranking all negative pairs above all positive pairs. Negative pair means you have an you have a pair of input images from the same person, and negative meaning they are not from the same person. Um, an AUC between zero and zero point five means that the model ranks a random positive example higher than a random negative example less than fifty percent of the time. And this is not what you want, right? An AUC 0.5 means that it, it ranks uh, incorrectly 50% uh, of the time. And this is kind of saying that your model is doing a random, uh, random guessing. An AUC between 0.5 and 1 means that it ranks a random positive example higher than a random negative example more than 50% of the time. And that is what you should aim for. Between 0.5 one, and 1 means that uh, you are correctly classifying all, you're correctly ranking the positive examples above all the negative ones. Um, there's just a citation here. If you want to go read more about area under the curve, you should go ahead. Uh, this slide shows that, um, so in the first image here, you can see that the features, the orange and the blue features are separable. There is a very distinct boundary that you can draw between the two, two classes. But there is a distinction between separable features and discriminative features. And what you should aim for is try to learn discriminative features, where it enforces that the different, the orange and the blue classes are as far away as possible. And even within uh, the orange and the blue, they are as compact as possible. And these two criteria are listed as here, which is the maximal interclass distance, and which meaning, meaning that the two different classes should be as far away as possible, and minimal intraclass distance, meaning that within class they should be as compact as possible. And if your network does do does learn features like this, you uh, you will potentially be performing very well in your face verification uh, problem. And there are multiple, in literature, there are multiple uh, objectives that have been proposed that, uh, that do these kind of, uh, do, uh, that try to have higher interclass distance and lower intraclass distance. One of these objectives is a center loss. Um, so what center loss does is it tries to promote minimal intraclass distance while maintaining interclass separability. And how it does is that if you have a uh, number of classes, it um, calculates a centroid for every given class. Um, potentially, you'll be calculating centroids from all of the training data that you have. But since that is very computationally inefficient, what you do is you calculate centroids based on a mini batch. So if you have a mini batch of 128 instances, uh, potentially representing all of the classes, you will be updating the centroids for all the classes based on the mini batch. And if you do not I mean, if you do it this way, that you are not potentially updating all of the, centroid, all of the centroids in, in, in uh, a mini batch, but that is how you will be calculating it. And so what the law says is that given uh, the centroids for all of the classes, um, and given an instance, how far away is this instance from its true classes centroid? And if it is too far away, then I'm going to add the distance, which is which will be very far. And you're just adding that Euclidean distance into the loss. And if I am, if the instance is close by to the centroid, then 
it does add the loss anyways, but the loss is going to be less than. So it's directly proportional to the distance uh, between the instance and its centroid. And uh, so um, in this paper, the paper is linked. In this paper, they do a joint objective, which is basically you have a center loss LC. The joint objective is they add the cross entropy loss with the center loss, and they try to optimize their uh, network based on this. Um, uh, I think that you should also do uh, both of them together. Maybe central loss alone would not be able to give you a model that uh, does very well. Uh, so one of the things that we do, as you saw in central loss, it is not explicitly uh, trying to maintain interclass separability. And so the other objective function that is contrastive loss does this explicitly. It does. It says it maintains a margin m between interclass embeddings, interclass instances. And if you input um, uh, this function, inputs the CNN with pairs of training examples. And if the pairs uh, are from the same class, the loss requires their features to be as similar as possible, and pushes away the features of different classes by margin m. And if you see the equation here, y i equals y j. I and j are the two inputs to your network. Y, I, and Y, J, meaning that the two classes, two instances are from the same class. You basically just add the distance of the two uh, embeddings. And if they're not from the same class, then what you try to do is you, you, there is a max function there which says that uh, if, the, if they're not from the same class, and if they're M apart, uh, if they're not M apart, then I'm going to add that as my, I'm going to penalize the uh, network. And if they are M apart, then I'm good. Uh, there is nothing to be added here. They are far apart. Um, hope that makes sense. <laughs> the other one of the other uh, similar uh, criteria is triplet loss, which instead of looking at two instances, it looks at three instances. It defines an anchor. Anchor meaning an instance that you're just randomly choosing from the mini batch. A positive example meaning uh, that you ha this a positive example is from the same class as the anchor, and a negative example is from a different class from the anchor. And so in the previous one, you'll only see a positive or a negative example. Your network will only see that. But in this, you are uh, seeing a positive and a negative example, right? Um, uh, so uh, every time you have to uh, make sure that while using this, uh, using this loss function, you are making your batches very carefully. One of the most important things in triplet loss is a batch mining, which is that you should make sure that um, because you can easily make a negative pair because you have so many classes and you have so many instances within classes, but it's, uh, you have limited positive pairs. Um, and so you should make sure that while you're making a batch for when you're using triplet loss, you have those positive and your negative pairs. And that you are exhausting all of the, like all of the positive pairs should not be coming from the same class as well, right? Um, that won't be a good uh, data, uh, that, will, that won't be a good batch mining. Um, and so in literature, there's also a concept of hard negative pairs, meaning that you actually give the uh, anchor negative pair where they are from the different classes, but the embeddings look very similar. And so the network, it, you're trying to give hard examples to the network. So it's difficult for the network to learn, but it, uh, it does not see easier examples every, day, every, every single time. Uh, so that is batch uh, formation is one of the important things that you should think about while doing this uh, triplet loss. Um, another similar is the pairwise loss, which instead of looking three examples, it looks at four examples. And it looks at the, uh, so the idea here is that you have uh, four examples, two from the same class and two uh, from, uh, from different classes. And, um, and you're basically saying that my score for the positive class should be higher than the score of the negative class. This um, looks at the score distributions, and as you saw in the AUC uh, evaluation, you are basically saying that the, my score uh, for the positive example should always be higher than the negative example. And the confusion region here, there is always an over, not always, but a model that does not perform well has an overlap between these two score distributions, and that is where all the confusion is coming from, because uh, if you see that the score of the positive example is less than the score of the negative example, right? And that is not what you want. And so this uh, this loss function actually tries to pushes push away these two score distributions so that there is as less overlap between the distribution as possible and as less confusion, as less uh, the gray area. And so there will be less confusion. 
There, this also you have to you have to really think about how you're forming your batches. You have positive pairs and negative pairs, and there is no concept of anchor here, but uh, the same concept of batch formation and hard uh, negative example exists. Um, so moving on, uh, this is just a an overview of what uh, softmax cross entropy loss is. Softmax is like, uh, so P1, it, this is in case of a binary class. You have only two classes, one and two. P1 is the probability of uh, the input X belonging to class one. P2 is the probability of input X belonging to uh, class two. And it, this is just a, a softmax operation. E to the power Wx plus V, Wx plus V is the output of your network and you're just Exponentiating that divided by the sum of the probabilities of sum of the uh, exponentiation of the two classes. Uh, and as if you if you equate p1 equals to p2, you'll you'll get that uh, the equation on the right side, and this is uh, this is the decision boundary between the two classes. And angular softmax basically uh, combines the Euclidean margin constraint with the softmax. It has a very nice uh, geometric inter uh, interpretation as well. And um, there is no need of sample mining with identifying pairs or triplets or making four pairs at the same time. And, um, and all of the other losses that I discussed, the, um, the triplet, the pairwise, and the center, they're kind of fine tuning uh, your model. You can't start training your model base just by using that. You can, for example, use cross entropy loss to train your model initially. And then you can use uh, those loss functions to fine tune them. But angular softmax loss does not have that restriction. You can start training your model basically from scratch with angular softmax loss. Um, so this is just a repetition of the uh, decision boundary in the previous slide. And uh, you, can, you can also write uh, like the uh, dot product between w, x, can be written as the norm of the W, norm of the X, cos theta I, theta I being the angle between uh, the weight vector and the uh, input X. X is like the feature here. Um, so what, this, uh, what uh, this loss assumes is that the norm of the weight vector is one and that there is no bias. This just, um, I think the paper just makes this assumption so that uh, it's, it has a very nice geometric interpretation, and it's easier in the in the calculations. Uh, you can you can also not make these assumptions, but they are just made in the paper. Uh, so if you if you, if you do make this assumption, and if you uh, input uh, these values inside your uh, the first equation there, you'll end up the decision boundary as being cos theta one minus cos theta theta two equals to zero. So if you just put uh, w i uh, uh, length equals to one and b i equals to zero in the first equation there, you'll end up with this. And with this basically saying that your decision boundary is not dependent on your input vector x, and that it's only dependent between the angle between uh, the x and theta one, uh, the weight one, and angle between x and theta two, which is, uh, which is the innovative part here. Uh, and this is simply the angle bisector of the two uh, of the two weight vectors. And if you can see here, um, uh, yeah. So this is the modified softmax loss. That equation there, where you where you did make the assumption of W i norm equals to one and B i equals zero, is the modified softmax loss. And uh, this is just explaining that um, in uh, Euclidean space. And you have two classes, there is a linear boundary between them. And if you just project them into the polar coordinates, you'll see that W1 and W2 and the angle bisector is kind of a very neat um, uh, bisector between the two classes. And you can also generalize this to multi-class um, uh, case. And you can actually look at their paper and it has a very nice description there. Uh, Mm, there was a slide in between, but uh, uh, what I'll show here is uh, this is like the Euclidean uh, margin example. Uh, the first, uh, the first image here. The second is a modified softmax loss, and the third is an angular softmax loss. And if you can see here, the Euclidean margin, 
Just try to keep the different classes apart and the same and within classes together. The modified softmax loss has a very nice, it projects into the hypersphere and says that the two classes are separate, there is a separability between them. The angular softmax introduces an integer m, which is a multiplier to your uh, theta, the angle between the input vector and the weight vector. And it says that I want these classes to be combined uh, within as well, like the intra-class uh, distance. And if you introduce an integer m into the, into the thetas, um, you'll end up, and if you project your vectors on the hypersphere, you'll end up with an image like that, which, which you can see is much better than the modified or the Euclidean margin. Um, and so this is a very recommended, uh, if you have time and you start early, um, you should look into modified and angular softmax loss and try to implement this for the, for the homework. Let's see if this ends. Okay, uh, so we'll just go over, um, yes. Why, if you have time, does it take longer to train than some of the other loss functions, the angular softmax? No, it was just, uh, so in this recitation, we have an example of how you would do center loss. Uh, mining for triplet and pairwise might still take time. But if you, uh, Angular softmax will take a bit of debugging and seeing if you have the correct implementation. So that was why, if you have time. It's going to take time for, in the computation part, but it's going to take you time to implement it yep. yourself. So that's why we are uh, asking this kind of work. Yes. And go, please go read the paper as well. It's really nicely written. Uh, we'll just go over some example of what a data set and a data loader is. You would have already done this in part, uh, in homework one, part two. But uh, we still had requests to have an example of the data set and data loader. So we'll do this for this homework where you where the data is images and um, you make a data set out of that. Oh, I have to run, okay. So this is basically the import statements. Um, we're using pill import image and the torch, uh, the torch imports. You can write, <laughs> that's okay, I guess. Once. Okay, cool. Uh, you can write, sorry? Yeah. Cool. Um, so the code is available on the GitHub repo, so in case you're not able to see it very clearly, you can go to the repository. Yeah, but you can see it clearly, right? Okay. Uh, you can write a custom data set and uh, a, data loader a data loader class. This uh, data set and data loader are uh, coming from PyTorch, and, but you need to write your uh, custom ones. Um, if you have to write your image, uh, your data set, a custom data set, you have to define three functions here, the init, the length, and the get item uh, function. Um, so if you see here, the init function is taking two things, file list and, an, and a target list. File list is basically uh, here, um, you can define it your own way, but right now the way we are doing it is, file list is a list of all the image paths to your uh, images in, in your training data. And target list is the corresponding uh, label for for each of the images. So right now, there's strings here. File list is a list of strings with the where each string is a path to, to an image, and target list is a string where each corresponding a label to each image in your file list. Um, length function basically is the total. Uh, if you if you are defining your training data with this data set, you have uh, length should be the length of all of the training instances you have. If it's the test data set, then it's the length of the, all the test data that you have. And basically, it's the length of your file list. 
um, get item is given an index, it just returns one item from your training data. So right now, since file list is a list of paths, you open the image and uh, using the PIL library, which is Python imaging, I think, uh, you convert that image to a tensor using torchvision.transforms. You need to do that because otherwise your uh, your batch batches won't be formed, and this will just return you a PIL object, image object. And the corresponding label is the cellular target list of index. And you return this tuple. You can play with everything here. You can uh, do your uh, pairwise uh, uh, instances being returned here, triplets being returned here. You can do any kinds of any kind of thing. Uh, let me run this. And so this is a helper function for you to make the the image, uh, the file list, the file list here and the target list here. This is a helper function which, given a root directory, which uh, and the root directory would be a medium or large or your training data um, class. And given a root directory, it just goes over all of the subdirectories and JPEG images and adds a path into a list and the corresponding ID. And so basically the data that is given to you, the folder name is the ID of the instances within that. So the folder name is your label. And it first accumulates the folder names, ID underscore list accumulates the folder names. And then here it's just, it, it is just mapping it into zero to uh, the maximum number of classes that you have, which will be 2300 in your um, medium set. And so it returns the image list, the label list, and the total number of classes. Uh, let me run this. And if you if you do call this function, you'll see that you have a total of. Um, so here we're just playing with a subset of your uh, medium training data, which only has five labels and 18, 89 images. In reality, it's I think 2,300 and a lot of images. Uh, you can create an instance of image data set by just giving the image list and the label list, and that's what the init function took here. That's how we're creating it. Um, and you can see by just calling the get item and giving the index zero, you'll get uh, training data item and training data label, and you can try to see what their the shape of these things are. It's three by thirty-two by thirty-two because you have uh, three channels RGB, and the label is. Uh, because you did map, uh, you map from zero to the maximum number of classes, so the label here is three. Uh, data loader, you can create an instance of data loader by passing in your data set. Uh, so you're passing here train set, which is an image data set uh, uh, instance. You pass that, you pass the batch size, right now it's 10, you, you should increase that. You shuffle, meaning during different epochs, it shuffles your training data. And uh, number of workers is kind of how you parallelize between different uh, CPUs you have, and we recommend you using more than one. Drop last is basically if your uh, total number of training instances is not an, uh, is not um, uh, is exactly divisible by the batch size, it drops, uh, it drops the last if it's true. Otherwise, it, uh, your last batch won't be exactly the size 10, right? And so it won't it won't drop it or it will drop it based on the boolean, and it doesn't matter. I think it should keep it. So drop loss should be false. Um, and so one uh, good thing about uh, this classification and verification task is that Torch Vision has some kind of pre-implemented uh, data sets and data loader. I mean the data loader you're already not doing much, but for the data set class it has you can just. Uh, called torsion dataset dot image folder, give it a root folder which will be medium. So it does the parse data um, uh, utility function and the dataset class by itself. So you don't have to implement anything. But that is an example if you have new kind of data. For speech, the torsion doesn't have a pre-implemented uh, speech folder kind of thing. Um, and so that is why the example is there. You can just give the root directory, and you need to give that transform over there, the two tensor. Otherwise, it'll, it won't it won't run. It will give you an error. Uh, the same thing for the data loader, and uh, you just uh, and so if you saw here, the length it, it's exactly the same as your uh, custom data loader and data set. There are a total of five classes, and the total number of images is 1889. So now I'll give it to Suresh, who will go over. The architecture. Thank you. 
So we'll just look at a simple residual block architecture. This is not the residual block from the ResNet paper. It's a very simple residual block. Uh, so we're going to be uh, using multiple of such residual blocks in your network. And this doesn't have any downsampling. So what I mean by no downsampling is the dimension that you pr uh, give as the input to the forward function, that is the x, the dimensions of the input is going to be the same as the dimension of the output that is returned at the, in the forward function. Uh, you'll, that means you'll be adding the you'll be uh, adding padding to each of the convolutional layers, and uh, yeah, it's going to remain the same. You can choose to uh, downsample within the residual block also, uh, which is also a good approach. Uh, but you should make sure that uh, you're calculating the uh, further kernel sizes and the uh, dimensions correctly as you make your network deeper. So over here in the residual block, I have uh, alternating convolutional batch norm, ReLU, and again, another convolutional batch norm. And so as I said while explaining the residual net, uh, block architecture, so we'll be, <coughs> uh, uh, we'll be pushing the input to, uh, from the previous layers, and we'll be using the identity and skipping a few layers and adding this using the, concatenating this using the identity. Over here, we've used the additive identity, which is simply as simple as adding the output of the blocks of the sequential layers into the input that came in at the very beginning of the forward function. So defining the model, again, this is a very simple model. Uh, the, you can start off by fine-tuning this particular model for the given task. Uh, so the network, again, has a convolutional layer, if you can see within the for loop, a convolutional layer, a non-linear activation, followed by the residual block. So as you increase the number of hidden sizes in the hidden sizes list, the network is going to get deeper with multiple residual blocks. So some of the implementations, if you see uh, online or in the architecture of the res ResNet, you can find that there will be two of these residual blocks. That is, you have one followed by another immediately. So you can like experiment on uh, this architecture as you feel and find what is the best for this given task. <clears throat> so. Uh, Right, so this is a sequential layer, the convolutional layer, and followed by which we have a linear layer. So this particular linear label layer is the classification layer. So if you saw in the slides at the... Right, so the CNN, which has an embedding layer followed by the classification layer. So the embedding layer is important for your uh, verification task. So when we're going to verification, you'll be having the layer for the embedding. So over here, uh, this particular one is for the uh, center loss, uh, which converts the final CNN output to a feature dimension or the embedding feature dimension and uh, its respective activation. But for the classification, uh, whatever comes out of the CNN network, you're directly passing it to the classification layer. You can choose to uh, take the feature dimension from this particular embedding layer as the input to this linear layer uh, as well. So this is something you'd want to uh, tune your network for. And also you may not need this particular embedding layer as well. So what you can do is the output of your CNN network could itself be the embedding. Uh, you can directly uh, pass out the uh, final output as the embedding and use that for your central loss calculation. Uh, so in the forward function, uh, as you can see, we are running through the uh, sequential list of layers over here, and then we are pulling the output of the CNN network. So as I said, make sure that you pull across the height and width dimensions. Uh, so since it's a four-dimensional input, batch size, uh, channels, and then height and width, we are pulling across two and three. Zero and one are the corresponding batch size and uh, number of channels. So this is going to give you the output in a two-dimensional space. So uh, when you pull it, it's still going to be three-dimensional, uh, the third dimension basically being a one. Uh, you can either squeeze it or you can reshape it. And then you pass that through the classification layer. And this is the classification layer output. 
and this particular two lines correspond to the uh, embedding layer output uh, which we'll be using when we are using the center loss. And this is basically the unit function for the weights coming to the train function. So over here, the two tasks, as you can see, classification and verification, there's nothing that has been written for test verify. You can implement this. And we haven't even uh, written anything uh, respective to verification task. This is basically a very simple classification starter code. So again, over here, the data loader, you can just enumerate through the data loader. Uh, again, make sure that when you're running around your instance, you convert it to the device. Uh, you should also convert the model to the corresponding device. Uh, otherwise, you'll have some CODA issues. Uh, Right, as you can see, this is a very uh, this is very similar to what you should have implemented for homework one, uh, part two. Uh, we're just adding the losses, printing at every fiftieth batch, and right. So as the memory starts increasing, you might want to do one of uh, these things. So it's going to empty the cache after every batch, and also going to delete the local variable so that you don't face any code out of memory issues. Uh, this is not required until and unless you do face it, but it's always good to have them. Uh, again, over here, I'm going to uh, get the validation and the validation accuracy. Also, the train loss and the train accuracy after every epoch. So you should surely comment this out when you're running on your large data set. This is basically just to show, since our data set is a very small uh, data set, uh, the accuracies and losses that you see here might not be the uh, might not replicate what you will see on the larger data set. This is, uh, so yeah, that's one of the reasons why we're printing the train loss and accuracy. Uh, right, coming to the definition of the data sets and constants. So I have defined, I've used the image folder or uh, data set from Torch Vision and the corresponding data set. I have a batch size of 10. I have set the number of, number of workers to eight. So what number of workers basically does is parallelize your loading. So eight of the eight, if you have eight cores, so it's going to load the data in all the eight cores simultaneously. So as your data is large, you might want to increase the number of workers, and the number of workers is basically depends on the number of cores you have on your CPU or GPU. And yeah, I'm going to run this for four epochs. The input number of features, as I said, is three. That is the number of channels in your input image, R, G, and B. I have a learning rate defined, weight, decay. So as I, the hidden size here is what goes into the network as uh, over here. So it's going to have two residual blocks, one of 32 and the other of 64. And the number of classes, torch, type device, right? So. I define the network. My criterion is basically a very simple cross entropy loss because I'm just doing the classification task. I have an SGD optimizer. Again, the optimizer is something that you should choose uh, based on the task. Uh, SGD might not be the best. Again, you can choose the ones that give you the best result. So if I run this, <coughs> it's going to run for four epochs. You can see that it's printing the uh, losses after every uh, 50 batches. And at the same time, at the end of each epoch, it's printing the train loss, train accuracy, the validation loss, and the validation accuracy. Uh, so if you see here, the validation accuracy, it's started overfitting most likely because the data set is very small. The architecture is too big. Uh, but then, yes, for the data set that we have given you for your homework, that is pretty large, and you might see some good improvement. Coming to center loss, uh, the center loss uh, class. So <clears throat> what it's taking in is the number of classes and the dimension of the embedding output. and. Uh, over here in the forward function, it's, it's also defining the centers of the, the number of class, number of centers. So, uh, and it's going to uh, dynamically compute the new centroids after every batch or after every epoch. So uh, that's what the forward function is basically doing. It's calculating the new uh, centroid for each of the uh, class centroids. and. Now, how do we use this in our train function? So 
you have two optimizers and two criterions when you use your central loss. So as Hira said, you should have a joint uh, <coughs> loss function. So one is the central loss and the other one is the cross entropy loss. So over here, the criterion label is the cross entropy loss where you pass in the outputs of the classification layer along with the labels. Whereas for the criterion loss, you pass uh, criterion loss is your central loss fun uh, class. You pass in the feature or the embedding from the network, and that's going to give you the central loss. You weight it accordingly, that lambda that you saw in the slide. So we have uh, C loss weight. So as you saw in the slides, you should have seen as lambda increases, the separability increases. So C loss weight is 1 over here. Uh, again, everything else remains the same. Mm. Again, the classify test uh, with the central loss, again, I've modified it to accommodate the C loss and the label loss, uh, respectively. Over here, we're defining the C loss weight as 1, that's the lambda. The learning rate for the central loss is 0 0.5, and the feature dimension is 10. So if you saw in the network, you should have Notice that uh, I, back here, you have a feature dimension which is being used for the embedding layer. As I said, you need not have these two layers. You can directly pass this reshaped output over here as your embedding. So you should find out what the uh, final shape of this output, that's out, output shape of one, that's going to be your embedding size. So you can directly use this for your central loss as your embedding. Uh, Right, so <clears throat> that, and then I'm in, uh, initializing the two criterions. One is the cent uh, central loss, other one is the cross entropy loss, and their respective optimizers. Now, when I train this network with central loss, surely we don't want to compare the two models over here with this data set, but It's slower than the other network for sure. Uh, but yeah, you can see that it's co constantly increasing and it's reached a better train accuracy and a better validation accuracy. That's basically the implementation of central loss. But you would want to implement the central loss more for your verification task, which we haven't given you here in the starter code. And the other one is a triplet loss. We're not going to be implementing the triplet loss with the network. That's something that you should experiment do, uh, you should do yourself. Uh, so PyTorch has the triplet loss uh, definition uh, in the package. So you just have to, all you have to do is n dot triplet margin loss. The thing that you should take care of, as Hira mentioned, is that is your batching. Make sure you have positive and negative samples in every batch. And basically what you do is when you're passing it to the triplet loss, um, criterion, you should make sure that the anchor image is followed by the positive image and followed by the negative image. You can see that we've taken two samples from labels 3 and one sample from label 2. And you can see the loss that got calculated from this particular sample was 0 0.2777. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much the implementation of triplet loss for a very simple sample, but yeah, any other questions? That's the end of the recitation. Any questions? Okay. All the best for the homework. Start early, surely will help you.